Let's make planning this year's garden a lot easier with the Planter app. This app is packed full of features. It has companion and combative planting, which are indicated by green and red circles. It has a simple drag and drop interface. It has 80 plus plants and thousands of varieties. All the info is needed to grow veggies, including when to start seeds, transplant and harvest, the ability to create custom plants and varieties, a growing guide with in-depth articles to supplement the quick info in the app, not to mention that you can view it and use it both on your PC and on your mobile device, so you can always be planting your garden on the go. This app is used in my garden year-round to plan the upcoming seasons, reference the last year's seasons so I know when to rotate, and it also helps me to learn more about companion planting using the visual cues. When you create your garden, it's going to be based on the dimensions and each block is going to be a square foot. I've had a lot of fun using this app and the Planter app, which is spelled P-L-A-N-T-E-R, is available in your app store on both Google and Apple. So what are you waiting for? Get out there and plan your garden and use the link below to get a discount on the Planter app. To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. Well, good morning all to, to all the gardeners and homesteaders out there. Um, I'm laughing because one of our least favorite subjects we feel the need that we have to talk about today, and that is going to be pests in your spring garden. They're horrible and they're gross. And do you have anything you'd like to say about them? Let's just get all like being super nasty about them. So then we can be intelligent afterwards. How's that? I was cleaning some broccoli, <laughs> store-bought broccoli this morning. Um, I was going to roast it up. You know, my favorite ways to eat most things. And I was like, I was kind of squinting to see what, what's, what is that? And, and in the moment, I'm like, if I see like one single bug in my broccoli, am I going to be freaked out? Maybe a little because it's been in my refrigerator for like a week, you know, but think about all of the bugs that are, you know, if I'm lucky enough to get broccoli from my garden. Yeah. Yeah. I, what is it about seeing a bug in your produce that like when you buy it, you're like, oh, hell no. But when you get out of your garden, you're like, yes, yeah, expected. Mm-hmm. Do you ever, do you have mm-hmm. that? Well, yeah, I think there's this thought of like, there's so many things, so many opportunities to be debugged (laughs) when you're buying it. It's like, how did you bake it through? Um, But let's, this is actually, it's what we just talked about may even be relevant to the topic. So bugs in general are a thing. And I look at them differently as I look at like pest, pesty things, things that are a nuisance. So are we talking about both today or are we just talking about... You know, the bad guys. Let's talk about the bad guys. But we can also talk a little bit about the good guys, too, because I think we should, and gals, we should uh, give them their credit where it's due. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can dig it. So for whatever the bug or thing was that's in my broccoli from the grocery store, I won't even say that they're a good or a bad guy. I just think it's like quantity matters, too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, let's the elephant, the elephant in the room is, all right, ladybugs are good. We all know that, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you get your broccoli and it's got 100 ladybugs in it, I mean, do you really want that? Actually, I wouldn't there mind because then I could put them out in my garden. But, you know, over for overall, it's like, no, I don't know. I don't know if I want that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, yeah. we're going to talk about, you know, different, different pests in the spring garden and treatment methods for them and kind of... I guess we're kind of getting it out of the way because neither one of us really like talking about it because I feel like we're like going to like speak it into existence as well. There is that whole aspect of it because truth be told. No, that, that doesn't exist. I don't know. I, I have Same not had thing. one pest this spring except for the aphids in the greenhouse months ago. Mm-hmm. That was it. I haven't had anything else. So I'm, I'm like waiting for the ball to drop. You well, look like either. you're like, <laughs> but I mean, you know, we're coming into a time when right now when we're recording this is my spring garden is going to be coming to an end soon. So I'll be surprised 
at this point, it's you know usually it's when it gets starts getting warm like this, it can either be really bad or not so good. Mm-hmm. So it's not like in between, you know, really bad or yeah. really good. Excuse me, not not so good. Well, I, I say mine. I don't have any. I didn't have any in jest because I didn't. As of this recording, I don't have anything planted for spring. I know or planted in the garden in general. Uh, well, that's. Maybe for thousands of people that are listening. Did y'all know that? I'm Maybe sorry. some of y'all did. I forgot there's other people listening. My bad. My bad, everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now we just sit and speak on headphones into microphones in our everyday conversations. Yeah, that's just for yeah. fun, right? That's just for funsies. It's just like second nature at this point. So what's your top pest that you deal with? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's... Um, Spring, probably. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, you don't believe it, but roly polies. What's the other name for them? Um, there is no other name except for pill bugs, which I refuse yeah, to call them a bugs, pill bug. Yeah. I'm a child mm-hmm. at heart and always will be. Well, I was walking through it because aphids haven't set in yet in the spring for me. And this is, you know, mostly early to mid spring. Um, even the cabbage moth, which is one of my number one pests, it's just not, it's not as prominent in spring um you know the things that maybe this is a lot more fun of an episode than i thought maybe (laughs) spring is easy peasy for best now i said that out loud i do feel like now it's an omen now it's definitely gonna happen for me um but no, roly polies, and and that's I mean it, it's important to know anything that's going to eat your seedlings, your young seedlings, yeah, dude, is a problem, man. Yeah, you know. What about the cabbage looper? Well, I I dump them into cabbage worm, cabbage looper. They're in my mind, they're all, they're definitely distinct. Yeah, you know, bugs, but they're all in the same category for me. I have some notes in my phone. I think I start to see her around the moth around mid to late April. Okay. You know, and so the damage starts, the damage starts to really become apparent around June, but by then we're exiting out of spring. Yeah. Yeah, because and you know, and, a lot of these will kind of fall into fall as well, so we need, do mm-hmm, need to say yeah. that out loud. I was uh, exchanging a message with someone in Texas? Texas. And um, it was on a collard green video that I did. I don't know if you guys know I um, I grow collard greens. No, um, nobody knew that. And yeah, well, you know, announcement. And um, and she was so sweet. She's like, oh, I, I really want to grow them for my husband. I assume her. I don't know her or her husband, but assume that maybe is a favorite of his. And she's like, I struggle with them every year, and she struggles with leaf miners. And so interesting. I've, yeah, and so um, based on the messages, it appears that she was growing them. Gosh, she told me the months, so it fits into the spring period. I get them occasionally, like on weeds, on the leaves of weeds, um, maybe a couple of flowers, but luckily I've not had an outbreak, but that is a spring pest. I've been fortunate so far yeah. um, for that not to be an issue, but they definitely do, you know, fly, lay eggs, man. Gosh, eggs. Yeah, eggs. And and so I do want to be clear while we're early on that we are going to get into the squash vine borer because in a lot of mm. areas that is a spring pest and there is new research that I have come across that I will be divulging as we get towards that part. What, you don't believe me? I didn't know if you caught the rolling of my eyes, so I needed a signal for the rolling of my eyes. Like, whatever, man. Enjoy the squash you're going to get and keep moving. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I you know it, it's one of those things where this year I'm I'm it's the second part of the war on them. So I've been doing some research, but um, you know for me the biggest issue is really it's the the cabbage worm, cabbage looper, whatever you want to call it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and it's that tall tale sign when you go out there and you see your plants and it's got holes in the leaves. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it, it's funny too because it's like you don't recognize it until you get. It, a bunch of them on there really you know what i mean because it's yeah, not man. uncommon for a plant to ha- get a hole in a leaf or something like that it's it's not terribly uncommon for that so we um you know that's something that we're constantly battling and batavia and i have two totally different methods for combating all of these pests 
Do you mm-hmm. want to say what yours oh, is? You're, not yet, but you're you're. I think our connection is cleared up. You're crystal clear. Oh, hey, am buddy. I? Hi. I don't know what's happening. You're pretty good looking there. What's 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 going on? New trim of the beard. Oh yeah. You're all foggy a minute ago. <laughs> Sometimes foggy is better. Like a 1980s Tetris game or yeah. something. <laughs> oh, pixelated. Um, the the cabbage worm. It's just it's hard, and I want to go back to the squash vine board when we get there. I do yeah. Want, I have like a declaration I'd like to make, um, but the squash vine or squash vine or the the cabbage worm or looper. That one's hard because by the time you, to your point, by the time you notice it, they're everywhere. Yeah. Like you have enough worms to do enough damage to take out, you know, um, a bit of your plant. Now, most times the things that they attack, they're pretty um, resilient. Like you can basically cut those plants down if you want to, you know, to try to manage it. Um, that's not what I do. You know, I'm going to say cover. You already know that. Yeah. They may not know that, but you know that. Oh, I know. That's how I manage against them. I, it's preventative. Yeah. Don't get there. And then um, I won't have a problem with you. Yeah. But I, every year I have an outbreak, well, even and with cover. I think the thing to, to remember is it may not kill your plant, but it sets it back a lot in its growth. Mm-hmm. And so like this year, we've had a really good spring garden. I'm really happy with it. And I think it's just because there's not, you know, we haven't had that pest pressure of as normal. And I do mm-hmm. attribute that to um, the fact that I brought in new soil this year. So essentially what I did is mm-hmm. I buried all the larvae and stuff like that. So that may have something to do with it. But, you know, without having to go out there, find plants that are just, I mean, I've, I've haven't caught plants before. It's really bad until they're like chewed up. And then you look and you're like, I got to save it. And, you know, there's mm-hmm. there's not much saving it at, at some point, you know, or it's starting to get really warm here. And then the plant, because when the plant gets attacked, let's say you catch it, you treat it, it still has to recover from that attack. And so mm-hmm. that time that it takes is going to be an issue for us moving forward and for the plant. So I think, you know, your preventative measures are very, you know, notable for that because you're eliminating that whole process that can go into it. Yeah, but, but if we on, just did that, we wouldn't have a show. So there is that. <laughs> no, well, no, but so as I mentioned, every year I still have an outbreak. So there is some moment where my cover wasn't covering, you know, and um, and just a note, I I use um, years past. I've used tulle, t u l l e fabric, like that's the fabric they make veils and tutus out of, and so I normally get like the um, one hundred and eight inch width. And then basically the measurement of my bed, because I put them on top of my low tunnels, like hoops and things. Um, But every year, again, there's some point where there's damage underneath that. Yeah. And so I'm handpicking, you know, as a remedy. Can you you say that again? I'm handpicking as a remedy. Oh, shoot. Hold on. Wait. (laughs) Good night. You can ding your own (laughs) stuff, too, you know. Um. And and my desk is semi clean too, um, but I'm hand picking primarily the worms that are there. Yeah, but that method doesn't impact the eggs. No, that not are there for as these. Well. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. If you pick one worm from the cabbage worm or cabbage looper, there's probably a half a dozen more, if not more than that. Right. So don't 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 see one and say, oh, I got gotcha. you. No, that ain't it. I mean, that, that's the like our first thing that we do is I flip the leaf over and I immediately get the smushing and I just smush and smush and smush and smush and go around and you've got to look in every nook and cranny. But that is an amazing way to start the treatment process for it. And it, look, I know it's gross. I mean, you know, it's just like in the summer with the uh, tomato hornworms and people won't kill them. Cause it's, it's absolutely disgusting, but it's yeah. like the best way to like immediately start putting a dent in the population because you're eliminating. I mean, imagine if they all went to cocoon, how many you'd have, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So it's like the first thing to do is if do it barehanded, get some gloves, it don't matter, but you really do. That is the best way. And for anything that doesn't bite, that's what I do is I just, I start yeah. picking and some things I can only keep under control by picking. Very few. You but feed, would you feed those to your um, to your chickens? You I damn put mine right in, I would. Yeah, I put mine in water. 
that somehow I'm less freaked out about that. Like I have like a mason jar or a bucket or something of water and I'll just dump them in the air. You know, clearly it's a slower you know demise. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think that I'm not like I'm not getting jars full when no. I'm picking them. You know, just again, probably the most I probably picked is maybe a dozen or something across various plants. Um, but the last thing you noted, like that's where's my closed caption? Oh, yeah. Let me turn that, that on. For this type of uh, pest, it's one of the few you said that hand picking could be really effective. Yeah. I mean, as long as it doesn't bite, like that's the, my first method. Because, I mean, I definitely go out there and I treat them with um, BT. So BT is known to attack um, caterpillar type animals and stuff like that. And it's, it's selective. So it's not broad, spe- broad spectrum, which means it is organic. So it doesn't really hurt your pollinators and stuff like that. But, you know, once we do our hand picking, we'll come out the next day. Because sometimes that once you do your hand picking, you're good. You know, every once in a while. But the next day you come out and if I see any... I'm spraying right away. And then, you know, it's important to understand the life cycle of the cabbage worm, too. So, I mean, because you can't just treat the worm itself. you got to treat the eggs. Mm -hmm. For me, once I see that there's damage, it's easily seven days. And that's just not there's not scientific. It's about a week that I'm coming out every day, checking, picking a few more, picking a few more. Um to to try to rip myself of them and it's because of my method of covering every time i'm picking yeah i'm uncovering right you know so i'm like like i spy is there another moth flying around yeah. you know it's a whole ordeal um but if you kind of think about how often i'm growing the length of time i'm growing and if it's a week you know that's not that bad of a deal um my last year my spring like cauliflower my um my broccoli I didn't I had netting on them so it made it a little bit more difficult for the moth to get to it but I watched her climb all up and through those little holes so it wasn't foolproof Um, but generally it got to harvest for those veggies before there was any real impact Um, I did have a lot of damage to at least one head of cabbage last year too but that's all mixed into those cabbage were in the bed a lot longer um and the primary culprit for, you know, the cabbage looper, and we can probably move on, would be my collards because they are in the garden. Car- collards and, and generally collards. They can attack kale for me as well. Yeah. Um, but they love collards like I do. So that's where they tend to go to. Now, if you're going to treat with like BT or something, it's recommended to do it every seven to 10 days. Um, in, unless you get like a heavy rain or something, but you can even take that a step further. And if you're really diligent, like going out there and smushing them, technical term, smushing them will help too, because you know, you're, you're taking down that population. Um, so you're not really treating for the eggs. What you're doing is you're treating the worm that's going to end up laying the eggs in the future. So, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're just trying to kill them as they come about. So they can't, they don't have a chance to reproduce because, you know, if you want to do an interesting science project, leave one out there and see how fast it gets decimated. You know what I mean? (laughs) And a lot of times when people use stuff like organic treatments, like BT or even inorganic, like seven or something like that, Mm -hmm. a lot of times people think that it's one treatment and it's done. And that's mm-hmm. just not the case, because once you start getting this pest, you're going to keep getting it over and over. So it's best to like go ahead and take care of it and then be on the ready. So, you know, I usually do about two to th- probably three treatments and then I'll just keep a very vigilant eye out and make sure, you know, because if I see another outbreak, I'm right back to it. And then the second outbreak, I probably will just go ahead and spray. Because at that point, you know that they're in your garden, they're embedded inside of your garden, and it's going to be really hard to get rid of them. Not saying that you can't, you just need to stay on top of it. Yeah. And I think generally, there's the recommendation, which maybe as I get older, I just give in. Um, While it may not impact you this season, but next season, perhaps plant those veggies in a different space. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's part of the whole reason for crop rotation and stuff like that. So, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, begrudgingly, yes. Yeah, I know you don't like it, and it is it's <laughs> annoying to have to keep up with. I will admit that. I mean, it would be nice to be like, this is always going to be my tomato bed. End of story. Mm-hmm. So there you go. You know, you think you're slick. I saw what you just did there. Um, I saw someone recently post in a 2023 video around, um, you know, kind of crop confusion. And I don't have any experience to say whether it's effective or not. I am a skeptic, you know, so planting other things, mixing other things into the space that you're growing, um, you know, let's let's call it kale and whatever normally attacks your kale. It's like, oh, it doesn't realize that kale's in that bed, you know, behind the daffodils and all of the other stuff. I mean, generally, I get the concept I just feel like kind of I've stumbled across it not working in my garden. I do a lot of, you know, um, what's the term? Um, planting of the same crop. Monocropping. Yeah, I do a lot of that in my beds, monocropping. So, again, I'm not the, the best resource for it, but just tossing it out there. Maybe some of y'all have had a good experience with it. You know, I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid on that. I got to say, and I'm going to, I'll say this. I think that we should give these pests and these insects credit because they're clear. I mean, they're clearly smarter than we think, you know, aphids go on certain plants and they don't go on other plants really. And, you know, these cabbage loopers, like the squash vine borer, for instance, like it goes for squash. It doesn't get confused and go to tomatoes and stuff like that. I think Mm -hmm. for some things it does, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, if you put me in a garden bed that was growing Butterfingers, Baby Ruths, and Three Musketeers, I ain't going to touch them Three Musketeers. I'm going to go to the other things. You know what I mean? Like, that's just how it is. So I'm not really drinking the Kool-Aid on that. And I think it, you know, there's a big thing that I've thought about for many years where it's just like overcomplicating gardening. You know what I mean? Because when you factor in, taking care of pests and stuff like that like it can it starts to get pretty complicated quick Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. um i'm not really drinking the kool-aid on that i'm sure there's people that have had success with it and my hat's off to you but i'm just i'm not willing to try that you know i was just thinking of trying to think about things that i almost never have pest problems with for spring lettuce um, it's kind of like lettuce, lettuce and chard, you know, probably spinach. Um, in the few times I've had some spinach over winter, um, there are a few things that, you know, just kind of can frolic along and, and, and feed me and there are no issues. Um, and complicated is a way to describe it. I think also just generally it becomes more and more challenging. Yeah. Right. It's discouraging, um, back to one or a hundred ladybugs, you know, one ladybug, I can definitely still enjoy whatever that vegetable is. A hundred, it starts to become less appetizing. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm just, just say it like that, it is, you know? You know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's like, so you haven't really had leaf miners, right? Not bad. Mm-mm. I haven't either. I actually have, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I don't think I've ever seen a leaf miner in my garden. But I did look it up. And so the damaging part of, and this is actually good news, which actually is the same for the uh, the looper and all that, is the adult doesn't cause the damage. It's just the eggs and the larvae that kids. do it. So, you know, mm-hmm. again, and, and knowing that little piece right there makes all the difference in the world because you know the treating for it. You can look up, like, how long does it take for an egg to become a larva because like I said before, you're not really treating the eggs, you're treating the larva. And by treating the larva, you're not going to get the eggs. So by doing these things, you know, like there's a, a finite amount of time. And it's not like people where it's like nine months until you're born. You know, it's weeks, <laughs> sometimes days. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's what makes it very, you know, it's a quick turnaround and it's a quick action that needs to be taken. And I think, I mean, everybody, then- go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, um, and I did a little bit of reading on leaf miner as a part of um, the the comments that I I was replying to. Um, does it say there? Because from what I read, it was like all, they're all season. Like there's not like a necessarily hot zone or not for them. That's the same thing for the cabbage worm. Once she comes, she's here through like right up until it's freezing. So, yeah, definitely I can treat the eggs and the larva and all of that. Um, but if 
the adult is going to continue to visit me, you know? Yeah. I'm still stuck. Well, and I mean, the thing is, so first of all, when you have, if you think you have leaf miners, you look for the lines in the leaf and that's just them eating through the leaf. So there is freaky. It is. It's a very distinct look. Like you'll know what you're looking Mm -hmm. at. Um, but it's yeah. not a variegated leaf for all of y'all that you know are into that. It's not that. Yeah. Uh, it definitely looks like there is a problem. And a quick Google on leaf miners, and you'll see if you have them, you'll see that leaf online. So you don't know. But go on. Yeah. And, and so it's the first thing you do is cut the leaf off. You can't mm-hmm. really pick them. So you remove the leaf, don't compost it clearly throw it away, get it as far away from your garden. And then that's like, you can start to get on top of them that way. Um, as far as like a treatment for them, I believe neem oil is a good treatment for them because it'll actually smother them out because it's a little bit heavier. So I remember reading it on the neem oil that I have, but again, I'm not really, I've never had any kind of issues with it. So I kind of dread it, too, because it looks so weird. I mean, that's kind of where I sit at it. They're definitely freakier things in the garden, but it does. um, It is a little bit off-putting. And especially when you're learning about growing different things, you know, sometimes my question is, is this normal? And that's absolutely not. Yeah. Um, Now, they um, they hatch every two to four days, too. So I just that just popped up on me. So you can see how fast you got to kind of stay on top mm-hmm. of it. Doesn't mean you've got yeah. to treat every two to four days because like BT and neem oil does have a time where it stays on the plant. But mm-hmm. with them hatching that fast, you need to be on top of it. You know, when it says seven to ten days, if you have leaf miners, you might want to hit it on the sixth or seventh day. You know what I mean? And that'll that'll help you get going in the right direction. There's um, that balance of that's what I do, even with the weeds, like I'll pull the weed. But if it's something like a, a I can't think of off the top of my head, a flower that I've seen with it on the leaves. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that that's been my experience as well. And so I'll just kind of cut away that flower or that leaf, I should say. Yeah. Um, and I have no qualms around like, but wait, but wait. No, I'm OK with it. And I, I think I would probably have just an awe moment if I had to do that with my plants, but you kind of, you got to do it. You know? Yeah, you do. You got to stay on top of it. Um, so I don't think we should go through this show without talking about roly polies. Do you? They just make me sick. <laughs> yeah, they make I me mean, sick maybe too. Maybe like four year old Batavia thought they were pretty cool, but I um, that's it. My roly-poly population has come down over the years. I was looking out there today, and it has come way down. Same with my snail population. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to attribute it to one simple thing. I took the wood chips out of my garden a couple years ago and haven't put it back because there's not as much rotting material. I know you think I'm crazy, but everywhere I look said that was like the number one thing that brings them in. And I mean, I had that year after I put the wood chips in the next spring, they were really bad in my garden, like really bad. Every time I'd move the chips out of the way, it would just be like wells of roly polies coming up out of the soil. It was pretty bad. And every single plant that I put in, they would chew up as well. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's necessarily wood chips or organic matter though. I think that's an important question to ask because, you know, when you put compost in your garden, it's organic matter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, um, the rolling of my eyes are more or less around, um, boy, you, you hold, you grab onto the thing and hold on to it. Th- four years ago, I talked <laughs> about wood chips as mulch and I've not been able to live it down. No, that was, um, there are two reasons why I stopped using wood chips as mulch on my garden beds is because of um i felt truly like roly polies were running rampant and i could i mean watching them crawl through the wood chips yeah um and then it the wood chips just based on how slowly they broke down which is actually a kind of good thing for the purpose of mulch it just made it harder to add more soil to the bed or add compost to the bed if i wanted to do that for um you know, amending it, it does, um, they are more long lasting. So the work I need to do this spring to mulch all of, all of my beds, 
I wouldn't have to do that if I use wood chips, but I, I, there's no plan for me to go back. Um, they are, they come, they're like a gang. They roll they deep. You know? <laughs> and I mean, I've, I've come out in morning, the morning and seen like stems of plants that I planted yesterday. Or yeah. if you're direct sowing, I had a lot of trouble with that. And we'll see this season. Um, I don't know if it's maybe not their time yet, but I haven't noticed. I've been out into the garden a couple of times this spring and I haven't really noticed any. So I'm guessing they're, they've not come out of dormancy yet. Um, Is it cold but there? Yeah, they're... Hmm? Is it cold there, like way below can't, freezing? Can't you see that I'm like shivering? Uh, yeah. No, but... we're, we're right now getting past the point where our lows are above freezing. Like as okay. of last week, we were still getting below um, freezing temps. We haven't really got... We haven't been below zero, just as an aside, um, since last year. We've had a pretty mild winter. I still hate every bit of it, though. The second time I've said that, it's still true. <laughs> so you do, do you think, I know you haven't seen them quite yet, so it's a little premature, but do you think that your population of roly-polies is kind of coming down a little bit? I could speak to last year and the year before that. Yeah, definitely. So in 2020, I think was when... Maybe I started using a lot of wood chips. I definitely, 2018 or 19 is when I started using them, but my space increased in 2019, going into 2020, yada, yada, yada. And so kind of that 2020, 2021, it was a rough year um, for roly polies. And there, I mean, for me, you know, I, I kind of go with the, you know, do nothing approach if I can. It was hard to get them under control. Yeah. It's a lot of replanting. But last year, I say that to say, has it, you know, decreased a bit? Last year wasn't as bad. And there's certain spots in the garden, and I can, to be quite frank, point back to, oh, that space had uh, absolutely all wood chips there. Yeah. Because that's also, I mean, the wood chips that I was using for mulch is suppressing weeds, and it definitely did that. But uh, it's, the, it's too the, high of a, a price for me to pay the closed caption thinks you said the wood chips that i was using for mojave suppressing weeds <laughs> i guess you're talking about weeds in a desert i don't know um yeah so yeah sometimes my know, garden is dry as a desert <laughs> yeah so i know we were looking at it i think it was last year maybe we had talked about it a lot like how do you treat for the roly polies mm -hmm. and we never really came up with a good treatment for them um, the one thing that I really found, which kind of, I guess it was two years ago we did it because the one thing that I really found was like, remove those wood chips out of your garden mm -hmm. and get them in. Now, I mean, let's not trip. So now, and for the past couple of years, I've used a lot of straw and towards mm -hmm. the end of the year that indeed does bring them in, mm -hmm. but it breaks down faster. So then they kind of, I think they kind of, they go away. And then they'll come and go as needed, which I'm okay with that. I don't want them building a damn colony in my garden <laughs> and just stay in there like stake and land. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if you haven't heard on a previous episode, but you're a returning listener, thanks for returning. And if you are new, so since I don't use wood chips for mulch, I've actually switched primarily to shredded leaves, but I also use straw. Uh, and you're exactly right. By the time we get closer to the end of the season, you start to see it's in the straw. I feel like more so than the leaves yeah. for me in my space, um, more activity. Um, but it's actually a really good principle that you noted, like remove the debris. Yeah. You know, so this is period for everything. You don't want um, dead plants to stay in your garden, right? You don't want fallen leaves i'm not i don't kind of um mulch in place so i know some people do that that's not my thing so that's where i'm coming from when i say like you know you just don't want to kind of chop and drop um again my preference um i also am careful around lower leaves and if they're touching the soil yes you know, so i try to keep an eye on that because it's like a bridge for them it, this i think you told <laughs> I remember the video I showed you, like, look at them climbing from the soil on the <laughs> yep. leaf to the plant. Um, so the stronger and the the more mature the plant is, the better off you are, generally speaking. Like, you know, my heading um, cabbage or, or broccoli isn't going to be taken out by roly polies. Now, will yeah. they start eating at some of those lower leaves on a cabbage plant? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so so here's the moral of the story. We shouldn't be slobs in our garden. And I mean, like today, I was harvesting two 18th century doorknob cabbages. And <laughs> when I cut them, I pulled pulled out the plant and, you know, the lower leaves fell. And my initial reaction was like, no, let's just leave it there. And I mm-hmm. thought about it for one second. I said, no, pull it out. Take that mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. second and pull it out because this is going to go in to effect. So if you have slugs, snails, roly polies, or I'm trying to think of another thing and I can't think off the top of my head. So we'll just deal with those three right now. The biggest thing you can do if you have them really bad is take um, something like a piece of wood or something like that and lay it on the soil so it creates somewhere for them to come hide during the day. And then you can pick that piece of wood up and then you can kill off all of those pests that are under there that I just Mm -hmm, described. mm -hmm. But if you leave like a cabbage leaf on there and don't think about Mm -hmm. it, not only are they going to stay under there, you're providing them food and then they're going to eat and reproduce under that leaf. And then you're just making your problem even worse. Mm -hmm. So there's times like this year I was doing it with um, Brussels sprouts. I would chop and drop. I'd leave them there. Guess what? Not only did I have roly polies underneath them, but I also ended up getting a white fungus underneath it. So then I decided like, no, let me go ahead and pull all of that out. Pull all the uh, uh, infected plants out. And guess mm-hmm. what? My roly poly numbers went down and my white fungus went away because mm-hmm. I created all that. And you got that airflow. And this year I'm doing the drip system and I'm noticing a little bit of a difference with that too because the surface of the soil is not damp ever. Hmm. It, I mean, I have people come like, you need to water your garden. I'm like, no, it's good. Like I just watered it for 90 minutes. You know, and as soon as you dig away from it, like that top layer under that top layer is actually very moist. So Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. that's kind of helping with it as well. I'm not sure. And this may be I mean, this is clearly going to be obvious to a bunch of people, but um, we always talk about the. You know, you can do a finger test, put your finger in in index finger in to see, you know, I kind of like my knuckle or down to the joint to see if the soil is wet. You don't care about that, you know, first centimeter of soil, No. you know, and how wet or dry that is. Um, because guess what? Your plants aren't feeding on that. You know, no. right? you know, they're not drinking from that top centimeter of soil. You know, those roots are further down. Uh, so I, I do think that um, it's easy to you know be a little bit lazy. And I don't think that your entire garden bed is going to be taken out because you left one leaf there. But it's the beginning of a problem. I actually was in the garden this weekend, but I only worked in the backyard. In the front yard, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And there's a space, I can see it now, a part of the bed that I covered with um, cardboard last year. I don't even worry about why I did it. And I was going to remove it because I knew that there would be creatures like roly polies. Um, But... I think there are probably more worms at this time of year underneath it, but I didn't remove it because I didn't want to give an opportunity for weeds to start growing before I plant it. Right. But I'm actually going to check on it this weekend. I'm going to be doing some planting this weekend. Come on. Um, Come on, somebody. So ch- yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> actually, that's pretty good. That's pretty yeah, good. I know it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, it's a little bit more of a draw and like a little bit more, you know, slow, but I'll give it to you. You're not um, supposed to blush like that on camera. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, but it's the small things like that, you know. Um, well, I mean, you're just giving them an weeds avenue. and leaving weeds there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're just giving it an avenue to take hold because Mm -hmm. one thing that's important to know about pests is, man, it seems like it don't take but a minute for them to just quickly get out of control. You know, I mean, if you go back to your cabbage loopers, for instance, like that's the one you can see the most because your plants are actually getting damaged in front of you. Mm -hmm. And it's like Mm -hmm. you walk out one day, it looks like somebody went out with a a Red Ryder BB gun shot at once. And you walk out there like a day later and it looks like somebody went out there with a submachine BB gun and just peppered the whole thing. So, um, you know, and, and not that this has anything to do with spring at all, but flea beetles are the same way. 
You know, they really get out of hand fast. Maybe we'll do a summer edition for this if we can get it together. So excited. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to take this opportunity and as you know, we've kind of gone through the spring and a lot of these things, I would say we've gone kind of in order from when they would pop up roughly. Um, <laughs> you know, and if you have slugs, I don't have slugs down here. Luckily, they're they're disgusting. But that trap method that I just told you guys about, about putting a piece of wood down, nice and damp, <laughs> leaving it, pulling it up during the day, I have single-handedly eradicated an entire outbreak when I was living in New England with slugs. And I went out there every single night. And I, as gross as it was, I picked every single slug I saw and killed it. And I give it a horrible death. I put salt on it and everything. Like, I don't care what y'all say. Because it was just decimating everything. But, you know, within about a week's time, I was on top of it. You know what I mean? So these things do happen. But I want to talk, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the squash vine borer. Um, actually, late last night, I did a mistake. I, my son's on spring break. And yesterday, I fell asleep watching Bakugan with him. I know you don't know what that is, but it's a kid's cartoon. And um, it bottom line is I couldn't sleep at night. So I stayed up for a while and I was reading about squash vine borer and how to treat it because I want to grow a lot of squash this year. It's very prolific and I want to kind of stay on top of it. So I was reading all the different methods that you can come across. Now, there's a time period of when they're active and mm-hmm. it's, it's very important that you don't say... Hey, Ben, when are they active? Because you need to look up for when they're active in your area. So they're active for me. And if you live, if you don't live near me, then you can't go by this number. And I want to be very clear about that. For me, it's like late May to late June. So what I do is I'm going to add two weeks in front of that. So I'm going to say early May to mid July. This is when they're active and they come out of the soil so they over, so all those little ones that you had last year got back in the soil and they laid eggs, right? So here we go. Number one thing you can do is till your soil. Really? Till your soil. Brings all the eggs to the surface and it kills them off. That's the mm. number one thing oh, you can okay. do. Oh, okay. Tilling, tilling, tilling. Like tilling, true, yeah. like with a, a tiller, rototiller, right? Um, you know, I don't know. You know, we've had this conversation about no-till and stuff like that and... I mean, we've all seen no tills and gardens and stuff like that, but people are still using tillers. They're just not deep, deep tilling. And so they don't stay really deep into the soil. So you don't have to till like all the way to the bottom, but you know, the first couple inches or so, just kind of give it a light tilling and then that'll help bring them up and then help eradicate them. So it'll, that's step one. This is like a multi-step approach. You know what I mean? So the other thing to do was spraying with BT around the time in which they start to hatch. So th- we know that it's a larvae. It's a nasty little funky worm with a little black head on it. So if you start spraying the base of your plants, actually just spray the whole plant with BT, then you, you start to get on top of it that way too. So you're, you're limiting all of these different avenues for it to take foot in your garden. I, I know you're not really feeling any of this, but... Um, you Batavia is what I'm speaking to, but, um, you know, and I think just like you do covering, I think is a big help, but the problem is, is they come out of the soil. So you already mm-hmm. have, if you're covering them, it's like, you're almost trapping them into that soil, into if that they're area. There, if right? they're there. Yeah. So you, yeah, your entire soil isn't there. So the part, and you're making it really hard for me to make this declaration. So a couple <laughs> of things, uh, uh, spring weather come, you know, if you're in, you know, northern hemisphere, your spring is the same time. Right. But your weather, your weather, your spring weather is very different than mine. So I do want to kind of just recognize that some of the things that I'm experiencing that are tied to how hot it is or isn't uh, clearly can be different than you know, for your garden or someone else's. But then for the squash vine borer and, and, and squash in particular, it's not a high value crop in my garden. Right. Um, but I recognize it is in other people's gardens. Right. So 
I'm inclined to say, I'll give you a couple of chances. And then if you don't work out, then I'm going to move on. But I know that again, it's more important to some other people. I know that it's important for you and your family in particular. Um, well, it's just another I, piece of variety. Yeah. But I think it's, um, the idea of like that preventative spray, even it just, it just doesn't, it just doesn't jive with like the way I want to garden. Yeah. I know this may be in part some naivete, but I'm okay with that for now. That's okay. That's okay. It's your garden. You can do what you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like my mom, she called me the other day and she she was uh, asking me for some plants, which she's apparently going to have a big garden. And um, she was like, I want eight squash plants. I was like, you want how many? And she was like, I want eight. And I was like, okay. And I was like, does that include zucchini? She's like, no, I want eight of those too. And I was like, okay. So I was like, I was thinking, and that's why I started looking into it. Cause I'm like, man, she's going to have a hard time. Mm-hmm. Now she may not have a hard time this year until it comes. And then when it lays its eggs and all that stuff, mm-hmm. then it can mm-hmm. kind of get one, you know, kind of spin out of control. Now the deal is like this year I came in and I'm curious to see how this works. I added a couple inches of soil on top of my existing soil. So the question I have is, have I suppressed what was already in the soil by doing that, you know, by adding that couple mm-hmm. inches, not giving it a chance to come out of the ground. So I don't know if that's an option either. Um, now I will say this. One thing that I did last year is I bought a bag of garden soil and I kept it out there mm-hmm. and I would go out there as soon as I saw any damage to the plant, I would bury the stem in garden soil because it's a vine and so as a vine what it does is as soon as you keep it moist and all that it will grow more roots Mm -hmm. so i had affected plants i buried the vine and they they didn't succumb really to the squash vine borer they were ate up with it now i never really Mm -hmm. got a good harvest and i think it's because it was constantly trying to recover so i was kind of having that issue but i did not lose a plant from it last year necessarily until the end when I kind of gave up. Cause I was like, all right, enough is enough. But for us, it's like, like I said, it's more variety into the garden. And mm-hmm. after I think it's been four years since we've really gotten a bumper crop from it, it would be nice to kind of add that into our diet. You know what I mean? It's been a long time since I've had like a really good squash year. And we know that squash zucchini and, and even, you know, your other squashes can be a crop that you almost can't give away, you know, if you're having a good year for it. So it is pretty interesting. And it's not something that I'm chasing the further I get away from and the further I'm like, eh. but I was just when I was kind of stretching, I was thinking to myself, like, I'm not sure if I've grown or maybe I've just not been successful. I've grown squash in the front yard in a couple of years. Maybe a good time to plant out a couple of squash plants in in those um, that front yard area. Gosh, I don't want to have to go back and look this up. I'm just going to make that assumption. I know that I had at least one or two squash plants in 2019 in the front yard. And I think maybe I've tried to plant others and they've just not made. No, maybe those were in containers. This could be the year. I'm yes. claiming it. And so another thing that I had a guy come over and buy some plants from me over the spring and we were talking um, and he was saying that he has a friend that takes the yellow sticky traps for flies Mm -hmm. and he cuts them out and lays them in his garden and the squash vine borer moth will actually fly to it instead because if you time it before the flowers start to come out and it starts looking, you can get on top of them that way and get them stuck. The only problem that I have with that is it's like a broad spectrum type deal. So like anything yeah. can get stuck in it. I think I'm going to try it. And if I start seeing like bees and stuff in it, then I'll stop. Mm-hmm. But I think it's worth a shot for it. You know what I mean? Just to kind of mm-hmm. because we know once you know that there's a time frame to really look out for them. I think that you, you're you're one step ahead of the battle, but yeah. you've got to know that time frame for your area. Yeah, and I really, I really want to be able to plant a rent like outside of that time frame, but I've had a hard time with late season squash plants, yeah, like for them getting to maturity and um, getting to size and then actually fruiting. So, hmm, it's a tough one. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's it's again, it's one of those things where it's a real deterrent because it is, it's an assassin. 
It is. Um, that particular it is the worst pest. pest I've ever dealt with. I mean, you're talking total devastation every single year. And I hear it from every everybody has the same mm-hmm. problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that a lot of people will wrap the stems in tinfoil. I have not done that because of it's a pain. You know what I mean? And it's like you said, it's like it's not a high value crop. But I don't like not being able to grow something because of this issue. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And then also it's it takes a, a bit of space up. So it's a lot of space to dedicate to then not get to like harvest. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I so saw someone in a picture recently that was growing um, yellow squash vertically. It was like a monster of a plant. I wasn't interested enough to like dig into like, is this real? Is this photoshopped? <laughs> you know, like, what's really happening here? Um, but I do know that that's been, um, I'm trying to think of the logic between why growing it vertically helps. Maybe that was helping with powdery mildew and not, <laughs> Probably. And not the squash vine board. Cause I don't see a reason why, you know, it just growing up would help. Well, there's so varieties of squash now that do grow in an upright manner too. Mm-hmm. I've seen those. I have not gotten them um, next year. If I can get stay on top of it, I would be more interested in buying a more expensive seed or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. I know that they say like, hey, there's certain varieties that are less susceptible. And I've seen in every single thing that resembles a squash plant. If it's got a big <laughs> yellow flower on it, like I've had yeah. the squash vine borer in it. Pumpkins, uh, butternut squashes, cantaloupes watermelons like all of them i've had it in all of them not as bad in the watermelons but everything else that i said i have so i don't really buy that school of thought um so what we try and to do is we're trying to plant early mm-hmm. and then if they get taken they get taken and then we start over you know what i mean i think that's been because i was i think it was two years ago i actually did that and just as I started getting zucchini, I got attacked. So that yeah. worked out well. So I think we're doing that. This that's why I'm in a, like a mad rush to get rid of my um, bok choy and stuff like that in the bed I want to plant it in. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's gross. It is what it is, though. But that's basically, if I had to guess, I'm sure we've missed a couple maybe but that's your biggest um culprits for the spring garden wouldn't you say mm-hmm. yeah yeah the other uh pests don't necessarily show themselves until we get to summer yeah and we'll be back about that more than likely so um everybody start hand picking i'm telling you it's <laughs> gross but you'll get used to it start hand picking and then figure out your treatment method and really learn up on it. So um, it, it, it's a recipe for success if you do it. And even if you want to cover and be like Batavia, then, then go for it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the hand picking also lets you connect with that plant a little bit more. So you, you're by naturally you're taking a closer look, you know. And so yeah. I think that's always going to be helpful for you if you're trying to create some plan to get things under control. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it, too. I mean... We could all stand to learn a little bit more about our plants and really getting down and dirty and checking every nook and cranny, especially the underside of the leaves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let me say that again, especially the underside of the leaves. So if you're treating, make sure you spray that section and you'll be on top of it. So they don't like to get sunburnt. I don't either. But you know what I do like to do? I like to learn to grow and grow for change and come check us out on all of our places become a patron subscribe to us on apple we have our special podcast goes out there and check batavia out at be better garden and me out at sandy bottom homestead on youtube then until next time see ya now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time all over the world people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in 
Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the Backyard Gardens podcast. If you like what we're doing and you want to continue to support the podcast, head over to our Patreon page to sign up. You can also make a one-time donation using PayPal. Both of these links are in the description. With your support, we can continue growing and helping others in their gardens. See ya. If you guys want some Backyard Gardens gear, go to the link below and check out our t-shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and other gear. All purchases go towards helping to support the show, so thank you so much in advance, and we hope you enjoy. We want everybody to have a garden, and we're going to give you a chance to win free seeds every month. Head over to BackyardGardensTV.com and enter your email address to be entered in all of our giveaways. Good luck! We want you to be a part of our gardening community. DM us a picture of your garden at Backyard Gardens TV on Instagram, and we will share it with our listeners.